I noticed that I was getting uh, some mentions in the uh, H3 subreddit and then some others because apparently um, Hassan had a conversation with Ethan yesterday and they covered Ukraine and people are recommending my videos because he's saying things that I have supposedly uh, debunked. So, yeah. I like, I really, I mean, you know what? Fuck it. Like, I, I really enjoy these conversations. <laughs> Ethan, with his uh, everyday, everyday wisdom, <laughs> asking Hassan just like the most basic questions and Hassan stumbling over them, flopping like a damp sock because he doesn't know whether he wants to... I think he's actually... He has said, hasn't he? He said that he likes to keep good relations with liberals and social democrats because he wants to ease them over to the to his perspective. And then when he's talking to fucking tankies, he's just like full-blown, like, pro-China, whatever the fuck they are. Um, so, yeah. Let's see how they uh, get on with Ukraine. Let's see. Western forces. Let's talk about Ukraine. Let's. And then that's my final one. Okay. So we were talking about Ukraine, and um, your your position was that the support for Ukraine is 100% manufactured. No. That's what you said last time. No, I think that all, all matter of American foreign policy is greatly influenced by manufactured consent because of our interest in, uh, you know, doing whatever the fuck we want to do there. Whether it be like bringing Ukraine into the Western sphere of influence or, or uh, you know... It's not. It's not genuine uh, it, because they want like genuine emancipation for Ukrainians. Is it not genuine? Because uh, I think Ethan said this as well. Ukraine is a pretty big trading partner for Europe and America. There's a lot of overlap going on there that we maybe don't have for other countries where there are other atrocities happening as well. But also, like, um, you can say it's an injustice. You can say that conflict and all that is more normalized in other parts of the world but that will influence whether or not you find something shocking or interesting a european country getting invaded is going to obviously be more shocking than like a, an inv like a coup happening in like central africa like, again doesn't mean that should be the world should be like that but it's like yeah but yeah like america had dealings with ukraine was involved in ukrainian politics well not just from 91 after the fall of the soviet union but also um uh even all the way up to the 2010s right with um like with anti-corruption stuff or politicians going back and forth or like uh, with the even with uh shokin with the ukrainian prosecutor so it's not exactly like it's just this random thing we decided to have a huge involvement but my other theory as well is the reason people talk about ukraine a lot more i think people talk about taiwan a lot more it's not just because of geopolitical interest and uh overlapping interests. I think it's also because these are situations that people are willing to be contentious on. Um, not many people have very strong contentious opinions on either side about the coup in Sudan, right? Most people when it comes to Sudan will seem to say that both sides are shit. Or Congo. It's not like anyone is picking a side of one of the fucking warlords in Congo. Or even in Yemen. Uh, Leftists like to talk about Yemen because it's uh, America helps Saudi. Saudi um, supports the Yemen, Yemen government and then they commit fucking atrocities in Yemen. But again, uh, the reason we probably don't hear that much about Yemen is because there's no one on the other side saying we should like absolutely support the Houthi rebels. You're not going to get that either because they're not great. At, they're not too good the, themselves. So when it comes to Palestine, whether you're left or right, like you've got people are going to have strong opinions on either of those sides. And that's why people talk about it, because it's contentious. Uh, Ukraine's very contentious, because some people think America is helping a country that's being invaded, and their geopolitical interests have overlapped with the right thing to do, which is not impossible. And other people are thinking that the Americans actually did this themselves, that they antagonized Russia, that they did on purpose, that they supported a right, far-right coup in Ukraine, and that Boris Johnson fucked up on the uh, peace deal. So, yeah. I feel like it's quite reasonable to, to see why people would care a lot about Ukraine. And because we see a lot of horror shows around the world, right? Um, you know, genocides, ethnic cleansings, human rights abuses. We don't actually see that many ground invasions anymore. Not really. Like, 
one country invading another country and trying to turn parts of that country into your country. That doesn't happen very often anymore. So yeah, it's newsworthy for so many reasons. The, the manufactured consent thing is just like, it's a way of saying that what's happening in Ukraine isn't that important in the grand scheme of things. Which isn't even to mention the effect that because of uh, how resource rich those two countries are, the effect that it has on everywhere in the world, basically, even the developing world. Jam Smith, thanks for the $4.99. Biden crime family, why Ukraine is important. Right wing Hassan. Ooh. So, so last time you guys compared it, you said, well, nobody gives a fuck about Georgia when that got invaded. Therefore, mm. you know, the fact that anyone cares about Ukraine is, feels like manufactured. It's not even just Georgia. But you guys know it's that, a... but you guys realize there's like a massive di I didn't know anything about the Georgian war. I learned about it. There's mm. a huge difference. You guys understand yeah, was, Well, that. I mean, the it's scale like, is it was a five day war. Yeah, it was five yeah, days. Yeah, it was, it was short. Um, Again, if Russia achieved all their goals in three days, and it wasn't a full on, yeah. But also, um, Georgia was like, a, it was an annexation, wasn't it? Technically, or was it like, would, would it still count as an invasion? It's kind of like, I guess this, this happened um, in the build up to World War II as well. Anschluss and Sudetenland were not seen as as world shaking as the invasion of Poland, but yeah. Versus... Ukraine to drop in five days, and if it did, we probably wouldn't be talking about it. Because um, that's true. That's true. So, like the, the what happened was Ukraine mounted this uh, miraculous defense, and they've got <laughs> Russia, a fascist country, mm -hmm. on the back foot. And we all like when fascists very strong stress on fascist country, Ethan Klein. Wow. I don't. I don't out. think Russia is on the back foot. I think it's just like extending I'll, the harm. Well. well and and only furthering we conflict. We inflicted so much, and I, and I stand with the Ukrainian people because I perf I like I think Ukraine is a is a force for good in the world. They're they're on. Can I, can I, and just, I think can I just stop you for a second? Because you said one hundred percent manufacturing consent. Like that's what you is, said. Nothing is genuine. I said one hundred percent manufacturing consent is a like leading role in this. If you want to, and, and the it, reason why no 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 fine. the reason why I take issue with this is because. It's like it's like stating like I don't give a fuck about Ukraine. Of course I give a fuck about people in Ukraine. Uh, I want the. I think a good question to ask Hassan there would be, um, what would foreign policy news look like? What would world news look like in the United States if everything was given the amount of attention you think it properly deserves? Right. Like, that would be interesting. Yeah. I want the war and the bloodshed, the unnecessary bloodshed, to end. Okay. <laughs> My assessment <laughs> on the situation might deviate from, uh, you know, NATO, uh, like bloodthirsty NATO defenders you, or whatever the fuck. You feel like we shouldn't even be doing anything in Ukraine? No, I don't. Nothing. No, no, I don't. I think but you that, don't think so. You no, think I think that of course there's a, a, a necessary intervention yeah. that that must happen. I'm oh, okay. not saying that at all. I mean, I so, okay. I'm not gonna pause this much, but goddamn it. Uh, the question Ethan needs to ask now would be uh, lethal aid, non-lethal aid. Does the intervention mean you force uh, Zelensky to have a peace settlement and to give up territory? That's, uh, yeah. I've fucking raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for Ukrainian refugees. Like, I'm sorry, this is well, such a silly fucking thing that, like, I, not uh, from you, uh, but I hear so much from dipshits online well, let's want to fucking well, cut propaganda so and say exactly <laughs> suck my dick um, you know so you you do you believe that america's actions in ukraine are are the right ones i think that america's actions to a certain degree in ukraine is understandable it's it's reasonable certainly what the ukrainian people want but i think america's interest in ukraine is not genuine it's not genuine emancipation it's more so a continuation of the bloodshed well, which is demonstrated not by me but by american politicians like chris murphy who have openly said on the record that for five percent of our military budget we've been able to cripple cripple a foreign adversary's military budget without a single american service member dying in the process i would say that that is profoundly successful what are we doing in Ukraine? We're sending our refurbished old weapons and weapon systems to Ukraine. We have to replenish those weapon systems. It's a never-ending cycle. Of, okay, because of, there. Well, the reason I ask is because there seems to be a somewhat of a a sentiment in the left circles or our social. I don't know how to even describe it. Now. I don't know, but that that the the proxy war people say in Ukraine is unjustified. It is a proxy war. 
No, I know, but they're saying we shouldn't be supporting Ukraine and the whole thing. Yeah, I, I Russia can't, should just take Ukraine. And no, I that. can't speak for other. Uh, I can't speak for other leftists. I don't know what the fuck they say, but uh, plenty of those people also despise me and say that I'm like not pushing Z heard, or yeah. whatever. So it doesn't fucking. Matter. <laughs> I heard. I thought I heard Richard Wolf have some kind of thing like that. I don't. I can't speak on Richard Wolf either. There's disagreements that I have with Richard Wolf. You have okay. Like, so you're down. Da- you're down with what's happening. Down, you're no, down with what I'm not is. down yeah, with. Like pro- the the proxy war thing kind of goes out the window when one country gets invaded. Um, I don't think that's exactly how you would say a, you know, what you would call a proxy war. But okay. what's happening in Ukraine? Because I want the bloodshed to end, and the only way to do that is by bringing China to the table, bringing America to the table. The, you think the real Ukraine actors should, here? You think you, Ukraine should have, make some uh, secessions? To- like I think a pro- yeah, I think. <laughs> hang on, I think a proxy war is when it's instigated by yeah. Instigated by a major power, which doesn't become itself involved. Does he think so? Yeah, I guess he thinks America is like instigating or yeah. it would it would make sense if someone was using Russia as a proxy. Yeah, that would make it a proxy war. Yeah. To Russia, I think the original six point plan uh, that was a continuation of the Minsk uh, Accords that were tried twice and failed twice um, would be a far preferable situation than like endless bloodshed over, you know, inches of territory where, uh, you know, people are being fucking slaughtered endlessly. I don't endlessly. think the Ukrainians would describe it as inches of territory. Wait, what do you mean? What? Well, you're saying they're fighting over inches of territory. I don't He's just saying in the context of how stagnated the war has become. Like, the... the... There's... I'm, I've been thinking about this over the last year and a bit. Is every uh, person who has, like, the, I guess the Hassan adjacent position to this when they bring up the Minsk Accords, do, does any, I feel like I've never heard any of them actually elaborate on what the Minsk Accords were. Do people know what the Minsk Accords were and why they failed? Maybe, maybe he'll ask. Let's give him a chance. Back and forth is pretty If much- I was in Ethan's position, that's what I would want, and, and I would want to be what, the drunken master is like, I think Hassan has talking points. Like it's that what it, what do we call it? Post-it note politics, where you've got an issue, you have like three or four bullet points that you can fill onto a post-it note, and that's all your knowledge of the of the issue. So if anyone asks you to elaborate, like uh, it's a real shame that they didn't uh, uphold the Minsk agreements. They're like, yeah, what were they? <laughs> I I don't know. I think I don't think he would know exactly what they were or, or or why they failed it's like yeah it's ground to a halt at this point and it's this just, is what i mean it's, a it's like bad. a very cynical interpretation of what i'm trying to say mm-hmm. it is inches of territory physically when we uh, when we speak about it but you're i guess a like lot, does I, he know that the minsk accords were kind of pushed on ukraine that they originally didn't want them because they didn't think they would work does, does, does that ever come up or I think Ukrainian people get angry when they hear you talk about it because they. Feel I, like, I that's understandable. I mean, they I feel get it. Like you're, you're. They want full throated the support. Russian they they want and expect more. full yeah, full throated support, right? Like, they understandably want that, and they want more than that. They also wanted Article Five. They wanted full NATO protections and NATO nations. They don't. They don't like that you say that they should secede territory to a fascist invader. It's not even secession of territory. It's like prior agreements that neither party has held on to. The real Ukrainian criticism in this situation comes from people who say, well, Hassan, how can you say that when Russia has not held on to their obligations? And that is true. Russia has not held on to their side of the bargain on the Minsk Accords, but neither has Ukraine. And my point is, M- ensuring that with an international cooperation. I don't know anything is, about that accord. What is that? The Minsk Accords yeah. were. Um, so, this again goes deep into fucking history, and you can't always say like, "Oh, I don't know the history, so I don't know." Zelensky was voted as a pro peace candidate. Um, this w- Zelensky was elected in 2019. No, Minsk was 2014, 15. And then repeat like mainstream media propaganda. You know. Well, I don't. Okay. Yeah, I don't know anything about it. <sighs> Ukraine as a nation state has uh, has even predated, or some form of like Ukraine has predated we'll even Minsk the Accord. Russian uh, nation state or the, the Russian empire, I guess. Uh, and its nation state development project has always hinged on uh, excising Russian influence. However, under the USSR, Ukraine, uh, which was uh, called the Ukraine originally, which just means like the border, mm-hmm. okay, was seen as, uh, I mean, had plenty of Russian 
uh, sympath uh, sympathetic people that lived in the eastern regions. Um, and that sympathy only grew the further east you went, the closer you got to current uh, existing Russian territory. Now that is... Is he going to say why? <laughs> is he going to say why there are lots of um, ethnic Russians in eastern Ukraine? So not a particular event that might have had something to do with a lot of people not being, like, with that population decreasing and being replaced by uh, ethnic Russians and Belarusians. There's not a particular event that had a lot to do with that population change. Anyway. Also, being pro-Russian, like as people in the East definitely were, they're probably not that much anymore, um, that didn't mean they wanted to be part of Russia. You can even look at the polling from uh, 20, even pre-2014. Even the uh, Eurasian Customs Agreement wasn't popular in eastern Ukraine. NATO was very unpopular in eastern Ukraine, but the Eurasian Customs Agreement wasn't. Let alone, uh, there's still not even any evidence, I, th I don't think, that uh, Luhansk and Donetsk had any thing approximating majority that wanted to join Russia or to support the separatists. <clears throat> that was never like a a plurality or majority opinion in that region. Crimea seems to have been. Again, I say seems to, because it's difficult to pull people in a territory that's annexed, and when the people who oppose the annexation leave, but... Hmm. ...is no longer the case. Make no mistake, I'm not saying that at all. It's, and that is no longer the case, almost entirely due to Russia's actions in that area. Like, blowing the shit out of Kharkiv is going to make sure, is the fastest way to make sure that there is no sympathies for your government whatsoever, fucking ever, ever again for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. So, that's all gone away. Um, but, originally, the contention was LPR and DPR, through Russian influence, and this is the Ukrainian assessment of the situation, these two areas uh, wanted autonomy, and were getting backed by the Russian government, and Western involvement that wanted to keep Ukraine in the sphere of the West did not want to give the actual protective assurance, uh, assurances sorry, to Ukraine, but wanted to play the, the delicate balance of like saying, you know what, yeah, maybe we'll get you in the NATO, maybe we'll get you in the NATO with no real interest in getting them into NATO, maybe we'll get So what happened in Donetsk and Luhansk is not just the ukrainian interpretation or the ukrainian assessment i don't know why he's saying that as if to like i think russia might be the only country that disagrees with what happened there what happened there was that after uh yanukovych was overthrown not the population of those regions but a group of russian-backed separatists like armed people started occupying government buildings and television broadcasters and declared themselves independent like that they tried to do like an actual coup not like a popular revolution or anything like that like not anything that had any uh moral or like uh practical mandate just that they were russian backed with arms and they tried to take over that's what started what happened in 2014 in, in the Donbass. That's why Ukraine, that's why the fighting started, was because armed Russian-backed mercenaries were taking over government buildings and saying that we want to be part of Russia. But I guess if we can, hang on, I don't think we're going to get any elaboration on Minsk. So let's do it ourselves, okay? Let's do a little rundown on why Minsk failed. The first fairly obvious problem with the Minsk Accords here, so a list of bullet points on it. This particular one here, withdrawal of foreign armed formations, military equipment, and mercenaries. Um, this was never getting uphold, uh, upheld by Russia. The Ukrainians knew it was never getting upheld by Russia because at the time of the Minsk Accords, Russia denied that they had any uh, foreign mercenaries in the region. They admitted it later, but when the Minsk Accords were happening, Russia did, said that this didn't even exist. This point wasn't even, like, real. And then the Ukrainians, who did know that there were Russian mercenaries there, who had seen people with, like, the insignias and all that shit, were like, okay, well, we're not going to uphold our honor our, our either. So then <clears throat> Ukraine thinks, like, if we stop, uh, if we do, like, agree to a ceasefire, then Russia is just going to use the opportunity to push us further back. So then, yeah, like, that's why the big, big reason that Minsk was never going to happen. But that's just within the Minsk Accord itself. There is also... 
the other issue is we're going a little bit too far down the line. So let's just say, so let's say Minsk is here. Minsk one and two. And this is in 20 by 2015. So this is one agreement that fails. If we go all the way back to the fall of the Soviet Union, um, we'll go a little bit after. We'll say, was it 94? Uh, Budapest memorandum, where Ukraine gives up their nuclear weapons in exchange for having their territorial sovereignty respected by Russia and by the United States, including Crimea. This has since been broken by Russia. Okay, that's one. Um, I think as far as Crimea goes, in 2004, no way, when was Tuzla? Two, three. Tuzla Island uh, is a very small sandbar um, island that's part of Crimea, between Crimea and Russia. And in 2003, Russia started trying to build, I think they tried to build a dam there, or they tried to build an installation there, and they moved their own uh, personnel in without consent from the Ukrainian government in violation of an agreement where Russia was going to do that. They, the Russia wasn't going to just unilaterally make decisions with Crimea with their own officials without consent. So again, this was a deal that was broken by Russia. In 2008, Putin claims uh, Crimea is part of Russia, uh, part, a part of uh, Ukraine at this point. This is after the Georgia War. After the, uh, during the Georgia War, Putin reassures uh, Ukrainians that Crimea is part of Ukraine. Broken by Russia. So I feel like after a few of these things, it's quite reasonable to assume that this, at this point, means absolutely nothing. Not even to mention, uh, we can go for 2013-14, uh, when the dispute between the Eurasian Customs deal and the European uh, Trade Agreement is... Uh, completely leaning in favor of Europe. Like 300 plus people in the Ukrainian parliament want to support the deal with Europe and not the one with Russia. Um, I get, what would you even say here? Like, um, but the Budapest memorandum also included uh, economic sovereignty for Ukraine and Russia starts using economic coercion um, to try and push Ukraine, Yanukovych to go with the Russian deal. So Russia uses... Economic coercion to push Ukraine into Eurasian customs. And I guess 2014, fucking Yanukovych um, orders uh, the Berkut to fire on protesters. After Putin told him to go harder on uh, the Maidan movement. So I feel like it's probably reasonable to say that if Russia has violated so many different agreements and different parts of agree of like the like every part of the Budapest, Budapest memorandum has been violated by the time Minsk uh, one and two comes in. So. I feel like you have to consider a, a little bit more of the history if you're just going to say, why did Minsk, why did Ukraine not seem very interested in upholding Minsk? And also the problem with Minsk itself is that there were terms of the Minsk Accords that Russia couldn't agree to because they denied that they were even doing it. And now it turns out that they were doing it. So fuck it. Does that help? Is that a good explanation? Okay, thank you. Uh, Philip Littner with the $20. I really appreciate that. I hope that explanation was worth that much to you. Wow. Get you into the EU. So how did with Ukraine no interest in getting them into the agreement. EU? What? How did Ukraine violate their agreement? Um, there was mass shelling on both sides, uh, like back Are and forth about the shelling. War? Uh, no, uh, back and forth shelling that has been happening since. Uh, Again, when you say sh there was back and forth shelling, it's so important to say to talk about which one fired first, right? Are you sure? Like when you say both, like I, I could say. There are killings on both sides between Russians and Ukrainians in Ukraine. Like, okay, 
Like in World War II, there were countries crossing each other's borders on both sides. <laughs> Between uh, Germany and the Soviet Union, there were invasions on both sides. <laughs> it's like, what? No. It definitely, it kind of important which one was first. The fighting in the Donbass started because Russian-backed separatists were fucking butthurt about what happened to Yanukovych, who completely deserved what, he, what, what, was coming, what happened to him. And then Russia got butthurt, and then they decided to support mercenaries to try and take over. They occupied government buildings, and they occupied television broadcasters, and, and tried to declare themselves separate, even though they weren't even... A lot of them were from Russia. They were from the Russian government. Ugh. So, yeah, th I guess that means that constitutes fighting on both sides, yeah. It's like, it's like saying with the Maidan, you know, there was, there was, there was killing on both sides, really. Um, who was it that did the killing first? The cops or the protesters? Who, were, who constituted most of the deaths? The cops or the protesters? Who was the one who passed laws that basically made it okay to kill protesters if they broke your anti-protest laws? One of which was, you can't uh, assemble as more than three people in a public space. I think what happened first, kind of important, Hassan, Dirk Kampfer with the uh, tier one sub, really appreciate that. 2004. Okay. Uh, so it was a non aggressive. With 13 or 14,000 uh, people dying. Okay. So uh, about in totality. That so that is, so at the time, there was a agreement called the Minsk Agreement. Mm -hmm. oh, there were two so. versions of this, which neither side agreed upon, which meant that. Uh, LPR and DPR would still remain under Ukraine, but would have autonomy, okay? And Ukraine understandably did not want this because that would mean that Russia would have an outsized control on Ukrainian affairs in Ukraine. To start a dialogue on interim self-government. So it wasn't that there was going to be one, there was going to be a dialogue on one. But yeah, again, why would Ukraine agree on this when that interim self-government, when that was achieved by separatists, basically like like people trying secession it's like if a, a group of fucking republicans got really angry about another biden presidency inshallah and they just decided to occupy the fucking uh the state senate of like florida or what's a more realistic uh, like alabama <laughs> and then there's a and then the american government starts fighting back and then some third party comes in and says you know why don't we just have a kind of like uh an interim autonomous government in alabama and they're like no <laughs> they're trying to secede you asshole in politics which it already oh, and it's did. also it's the those secessionists are not even american they're actually funded by fucking i even know canada yeah based through Russian loyalist leadership that they had that was, uh, that was obviously squashed because there's always been this back and forth between Western influence in Ukraine, wanting to move them into the Western sphere of influence, and Eastern influence, Russian influence in Ukraine, which wanted to maintain uh, Ukraine's status and, and wanted to change Ukrainian affairs. Okay, so they were okay. both attacking each other, and you think the attacks were equally provocative? And again, I don't know anything about. I it. think that I That's think that. Uh, Ethan. Oh God, uh, Ethan. the the uh, this was another instance of of proxy war, one hundred percent. Okay, like there are people who who uh, wanted to be a part of Russia, and um, the at the end of the day, equally provocative. Again, we've we've already seen how many violations Russia has done that on their end i feel like the timeline is so important like the economic trade deal in europe was supported by the majority of you by most ukrainians even in the east even in eastern regions um yanukovych agreed to it the ukrainian parliament agreed to it and then after some economic coercion from putin which was again uh, a violation after all that yanukovych switches and that triggers the protests. So who's being more provocative at this point? I'd probably say Russia, the one who's already violated um, economic sovereignty. That's probably that they've used economic coercion, that their puppet leader has gone against the will of the Ukrainian parliament and the Ukrainian people. That's kind of provocative. So they start protesting. And in response to them protesting, the president bans protests, almost all of them, and makes it okay for cops and civilians to commit crimes against those protesters. Who's been provo who's, where's the provocation there? Then, nonviolent protesters get killed by the cops, 
and then the protests just started to get violent. Is that equal provocation on both ends? Yanukovych, after all this fighting, loses all his credibility, fucks off to Russia, and then Putin annexes Crimea and ignites a civil war in the Donbass. Equal levels of provocation. Because on the other side, there's a phone call where a woman said that she would prefer this candidate to be the next prime minister, even though he was already the leader of the opposition and the favorite to become the next prime minister with 300 votes in the parliament. Is that, is that, uh, though like the reaction from the ukrainian government to that was uh, understandable they wanted to protect their own interests they wanted to protect their own borders they wanted to protect their hegemo uh, hegemony and uh and and national security interests but there's a difference between like what they did in crimea for example and what they did with lpr and dpr what do they do in crimea there there was a referendum people say it was bullshit referendum it was under gunpoint which is understandable to say that because that is what happened in crimea but russian territorial claims to crimea uh, as a, like, Russian territorial claims that Crimea had more historical prescience and, and, and the highest level of support uh, for, uh, you know, uh, a Russian expansionist uh, policies in Crimea specifically because of its uh, military base uh, that the Russian military uh, operated out of, okay? And what did Ukraine do in that situation? They cut the water supply. They immediately fucking broke a dam, a USSR era dam that was offering supply, like water, water for the Crimean citizens that they said they, you know, cared about. You talking about that recently? That no. It wasn't, um, you can debate the ethics of that if you want. Like, I don't think it's something I would have supported. It, they didn't blow up a dam or whatever. They cut, it was a canal that they cut. It was water for like irrigation and shit. It wasn't, I don't think it was drinking water. Yeah, it was for irrigation. And the problem is, there's two problems. One is that Crimea is annexed. It becomes Russia's responsibility. So le that's a legal thing. But the other problem was, was that Russia was using Crimea to conscript tens of thousands of people and to amass military installations near the border. They militarized the fuck out of Crimea after annexing because it turns out that Crimea was a, uh, through 2014 to 2022, was being built up as a launch pad for the invasion. That's why you see all those tanks and uh, supplies going over the Kersh Bridge. So I, I, it's just so weird that he would say, like, it's not like they did it just to be cruel. They did it because they wanted to slow down what they saw as a military buildup on their border in an annexed territory. It's not like Crimean citizens, a lot of whom are Ukrainian or Tatar, were just sitting there, like, and their taps aren't... Or they're having to take, like, three-minute showers or some shit. Like, that's not exactly how it worked. But, eh. You can challenge it if you want. Like, it's, it's a very contentious decision, but... It's a bit more nuanced than these fucking dipshits are making it out to be, but yeah. That dam has been destroyed okay. when Russia invaded Ukraine. But essentially, I wanted to clarify like they, your... they cut Crimea off, and, and not in the same way that they uh, wanted to deal with LPR and DPR. I wanted to clarify your position. Yes. Because it seems like there's a lot of confusion, so it's good to clarify. You do <laughs> support... This will not clarify my position. In the eyes of people Why? who want to say that you I'm say like anti-Ukraine, people that... are still going to fucking yell at me. But you said that you believe... It's big... Again, I don't know. I don't think I've ever, ever tried to say that Hassan is like... The, the, the Hassan just like hates Ukrainians or he's pro-Russia. I don't think I've ever done that. But it's like, the reason people talk about your takes is because they're fucking stupid. That's why people talk about your... Again, it's just... I don't, know. I don't even know why I'm saying it. He's not going to listen to me. Whatever. <laughs> what America is doing in Ukraine is right. I believe that Ukraine has a right to emancipation. What America should do in Ukraine is in sh is offer security commitments and assurances, and only and you can only get that by arriving at a, a at a table where you don't fucking uh, destroy the the bargaining chips and instead allow the original security commitments to continue.
a, a I don't know what you mean by that. You mean so go at the table Ukrainian with envoys and Russian envoys got together in Antalya and put a 15 point security plan together oh my uh, God. as they were negotiating you're, the terms of a ceasefire Ukraine agreement. And Russia, they, we need to get them. And I mean, that. <laughs> Is he going to say why that uh, peace negotiation never happened? <laughs> oh, no. Bear in mind, um, there are so many points that go against what he's saying. Is how many uh, peace negotiations and ceasefires have Russia already broken? Uh, the fact that they were only sending delegates who had no power to the meetings. Uh, the fact that whilst that 15-point plan was being drafted, or I think it was even around the same time it came out, the Russian ambassador went to the UN and said that Ukraine had a bioweapons program. <laughs> like. I feel like if you're going to do that with the kind of dog shit evidence that he had, I, I feel like you're just going to, you might as well just have a, like a tattoo on your forehead that says, I can't be negotiated with because I'm fucking mental. <laughs> and also, um, the week before those negotiations uh, started to fall apart, Russia already said that Ukraine's uh, end of the of the demands were completely unreasonable. Lavrov said that. And they also uncovered the worst war crimes in European history since the Yugoslav War with uh, Bucha. And after that, after the fact that Bucha happened after Ukraine had spent months trying to negotiate for humanitarian corridors and ceasefires, and, just, and then that's what they get when they liberate one of their towns. And then Erpin, and the, yeah, okay. So, uh, uh, it's kind of like it's kind of like the fucking Battle of Budapest is happening in like 1944 or whatever the fuck it was. And so, and there are people probably there probably were people going around being like, or like the the Americans have just landed in Italy, or and it, and people are just like. Can we negotiate? Like we should, we should. Uh, now is a good time to stop fighting and uh, have some kind of a settlement. You know, Germany keeps like a wee bit of Poland, a wee bit of uh, all of Austria because you know it's basically German. It's not that easy, I would assume. Well, it, it there was uh, moves that were being made to arrive at that. Seems like Putin, uh, in, Putin a, as like a year just, ago, he's kind of like a fascist leader is. Oh. Yes, Putin's interests are are to take the whole thing. Putin's interests certainly are nationalistic. Uh, there's obviously <laughs> material benefits to Ukraine because Ukraine would be a competitor to to Russia as far you, as like oil and gas. You think the Ukrainians but... should go to the table and make concessions to the Russians. Oh. I think the Ukrainians oh. went to the table Which and concessions? made concessions to the Russians originally. Yeah. And it, it was actually a very clever move by Zelensky to like, for example, uh, push the Crimean referendum 15 years down the line in order to not uh, deliberate on that aspect right now because Ukrainians want Crimea back as well. They want LPR and DPR to be Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. um, and Zelensky knew that that was going to be an like impossible thing to deal with because he's Right now, on the one hand, you have Ukrainians with re with uh, interest in emancipation, ridding. Uh, I don't even think is that I. I couldn't actually find a consistent answer on this. I don't actually know if it was um, Zelensky who called off that talk, that fifteen point thing, the fifteen point agreement, because this is an article from the Financial Times. When the fifteen point deal is announced. So it's, it's in the open now. And they're saying Putin showed no signs of compromise, vowing Moscow would achieve all of its war aims. All of Putin's war aims, by the way, which included um, demilitarizing Ukraine, denazifying, that was still on the table then, and what was it, like um, sovereignty for Donbass and Crimea. Like they were demanding quite, <laughs> they were demanding like the kind of, they were demanding a surrender at this point. Was that after Butcha? No. Um, well, Butcha was before the 15 point thing fell apart. So, the, yeah. But most people seem to agree that Butcha was the reason that Ukraine decided that they were never going to be able to negotiate with Russia, that they were going to have to fight and push them back and force them to accept concessions rather than to negotiate in the middle of an invasion. Yeah. The Russian scourge from their uh, borders. Uh, and, and taking back all of their territory from Russia, which includes Crimea as well. So he has a delicate balance where he has to make sure that those guys are not pissed off 
uh, and and uh, you know overthrow him and then like uh, you know or or that hey, American thing here ridding uh, the Russian scourge from their uh, borders to the Russians originally. Yeah. And it, it was actually a very clever move by Zelensky to like, for example, uh, push the Crimean referendum 15 years down the line in order to not uh, deliberate on that aspect right now because Ukrainians want Crimea back as well. They want LPR and DPR to be Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And Zelensky knew that that was going to be an like impossible thing to deal with because he's Right now, on the one hand, you have Ukrainians with, re with uh, interest in emancipation, ridding uh, the Russian scourge from their uh, borders uh, and, and taking back all of their territory from Russia, which includes Crimea as well. So he has a delicate balance where he has to make sure that those guys are not pissed off uh, and, and uh, you know, overthrow him. And then like, uh, you know, you just know. I, I, actually, no, I don't know. Let's be charitable. But it feels like he's, um, if this was a, a tanky audience, like or without, without Ethan there, it sounds like he's saying that Zelensky has got the, uh, the fucking Ukrainian neo-Nazi gun to his head saying, don't give up, don't negotiate, don't, like, see, don't cede anything. We're, we want war, we want American help, and we want to fucking drive the orcs out and all that shit. Seems like that's what he's saying? Or, or, or that America uh, somehow gets I, involved I and overthrows them I, while assume, simultaneously ending the war. I'm assume America! Did I hear that properly? No way. Delicate balance where he has to make sure that those guys are not pissed off uh, and, and uh, you know, overthrow him and then, like, uh, you know, or, or that America uh, somehow gets I, involved I and overthrows them. I, I'm while I'm Bro. I don't think that is in Zelensky's calculations. I don't think he's sitting there thinking, oh, this is actually a really good deal the Russians are offering. It's a shame I can't because um, America will overthrow me. I, I just don't think that's ever going to be a thing. Yeah, this is fan fiction. How does he get away with it? Like, sure, like, I know, again, Ethan always says he's not, he, well, Ethan feels like he's not informed and all that, but, oh, God. Like, that is just such a fucking, that's an un unbelievably stupid thing to say. Oh, God. Simultaneously ending the war. I'm assuming where people get mad at you is just the suggestion that Ukraine should make concessions to an aggressive fascist invader. Because, as we know, you know, European fascist invaders, um, People often wonder they don't you know, stop. if we if we made if we didn't make concessions to Hitler would the would the war have happened? People wonder that. Hmm. Yeah, um, there's a there's a difference of like um, there's a difference of talking pre World War II and post World War II because we do have mutually assured nuclear uh, destruction. I was about to say it's so that, unfortunately the nukes change oh, it's all the calculus yeah. with that. So this that, guy's really fucking. This guy's so dopey. Um, <laughs> it's um what was i thinking the nuclear thing again it's not quite the game changer that they're saying it like it like it's not like nuclear weapons influenced whether uh the soviets and china got involved in vietnam even though america was on the other end that's a lot of nuclear power is getting involved there right uh and america got kind of ass blasted and pretty humiliated in that whole thing Again, nuclear weapons protect you from being invaded. There's no version of Ukrainian victory that involves invading Russia right now, right? I don't think people think it's going to be like World War II where they storm Moscow and fucking Putin tops himself in a bunker. Like, I don't think anyone is expecting that scenario. They're just trying to get Russia out of Ukraine. And nothing about getting Russia out of Ukraine involves nuclear doctrine. Like, nuclear doctrine doesn't cover that. Like, because these guys, this Dan guy, I'm sure, is just thinking that, oh no, if Ukraine tries to reclaim their territory, they're going to be a... Lona Box, Bukil and Erpin massacres were uncovered on April 1st, after the peace talks in Turkey. And yes, that's why we won't do it anymore. Hassan's Boris Johnson meme is just insulting. Uh, thanks for the 1600 things. I really appreciate that. Um, where the f was I? I feel like this guy is one of those people who thinks that every time Putin says, oh no, if you push back this region, 
if you push back this region, we're definitely going to use nukes. And they're like, oh no, we, should, we best uh, concede some territory because otherwise Putin's going to launch a nuke. But the problem is, the world's going to be a pretty gross place if a dictator gets what he wants Lone because he Fox. threatened to use nukes. Kundurpin massacres were uncovered on April... If... If a fucking leader, a dictator can say, make this military concession to me because I've got nuclear weapons, every country in the world, basically, defensive or offensive, is going to want nuclear weapons. Can you imagine, like, the precedent that gets set there? Like, Pakistan, fucking India, and China in Kashmir being like, this bit here, nuclear weapons. This bit here, nuclear weapons. This bit here, nuclear... Like, oh my god. You'd have a fucking, um, nuclear triangle of doom if you were able to threaten nuclear weapons over territory that isn't internationally recognized as yours. Over contested territory. That's, that's fucking insane. You would never allow that to slide. Because again, if you give up occupied territory because someone's got a nuke, like, you're letting every country that's got nuclear weapons just go absolutely fucking mental with it. And also, countries that don't have nuclear weapons, like maybe Saudi. Saudi might want to get some nuclear weapons, because, my God, Saudi's got nukes. <laughs> What's Yemen going to look like if Saudi just says, well, <laughs> you say that's part of Yemen, but, uh, hmm. Nuclear weapon, Habibi? Yeah, fucking, would these guys ever say that the fucking Israeli settlements should be annexed because Israel has nukes? Oh, God. Oh god, I would love to see that from fucking Hassan or this Dan guy to bite that bullet. Oh shit. That's the difference there, and that's a very significant one because Article 5 dictates that like any kind of NATO- Because the correct answer to that is no, by the way. You can't just give people shit because they, because they wave their nukes around. You can't do it. Nation that Russia- tries to attack, okay, because NATO was developed against Russia, USSR, communism, it was an anti-communist institution in of itself, um, immediately means that all other nations, according to Article 5, are drawn into war with a nuclear superpower like Russia. Right. So there's a difference. Plus, one other aspect of this is that, like, they, Russia kind of showed its ass and its, uh, its, its capabilities and where those capabilities end as far as ground war goes, which is the reason why you see Finland and Sweden, which previously had long-held neutrality, not like direct agreements, but long-held neutrality. Uh, uh, I wouldn't say treaties because it's not an official treaty, but just like didn't join NATO and understand immediately me. join NATO. Why? Because they realized... They don't have any fucking power. What are they going to do? Go to Finland? Get the fuck out of here. They can't even, they can't take over Ukraine. They said it was going to be a day. They suck. They, can, they don't have the power. They do so suck. Also, That's true. I don't know the exact name of it, but I know Ukraine surrendered their nuclear weapons, which is one of the best things you can hope. Worst things you could do. Never give up the nukes. <laughs> but like, in terms of like a humanistic... Uh, I can't tell if he's joking, but... Oh, okay. <laughs> a political move, it's bad, but like, a, as, a, as a humanistic some, thing... That's yeah, I mean, obviously right? we should some get say, rid of nukes. Yeah. Some so, say Ukraine so, had no way of utilizing those nukes because like the controls were... The control mechanism was in the USSR, so in Moscow, but... That's um, Moscow. But you still shouldn't have uh, given your nuclear so uh, you're, stockpile. So you're, it's not just that. Like, y even... In hindsight, the problem with hindsight is that it's it's hindsight. With the knowledge that we had at the time, um, the risks of U Ukraine keeping their nukes are so much higher than if they got rid of them because it would have been insanely expensive to keep that nuclear program going because I think Ukraine would have been the third largest nuclear power in the world, right next door to the biggest, like Russia. So... A, like a newly formed country, you have no idea what their political system is going to look like. Uh, you have no idea what they're going to be like when it comes to nationalism and like militarism and all that shit. Uh, you also don't know what kind of message it sends to the other part, to, to, the, to your bordering nations like Russia. If you are spending all this money, like basically militarizing like fucking Germany in pre-1939, like just going full scale rearmament batshit. That's a, that's a horrible message. And it's also just... One more country with a nuclear weapon, which means um, the another thing with nuclear weapons as well is just like the um, chance of error. It's one more country that can fuck up. That's a big problem as well with like proliferation of nukes. So like, like nuclear weapons are they're kind of they're kind of scary. Chat, 
It's insane. Like, don't people, don't nuclear weapons go missing sometimes? I swear there have been stories about, yeah, the United States has, is missing six nuclear bombs. And people don't know where they are. Didn't they lose one in a bush in fucking France? <laughs> Didn't they lose a nuke in a, in a bush? Wait. Was it 1966? A B-52 crash. I don't know. No, this one was recovered. You can, you can lose these things. I don't know, how do you lose a nuke, right? They're so big. They're not, they're not so big that you can't, yeah. So I don't really know if this, if this new country, Ukraine, this newly independent nation, with all the uh, you know corruption and the leftovers and all the bad blood between them and their neighbor, um, spending like an obscene uh, proportion of their GDP and getting foreign aid just to keep up the, the third largest nuclear supply. That's that's yeah, it's pretty risky. But the trade off is that by taking their nukes away, is that America basically has to defend nuclear uh, defend Ukraine sovereignty because otherwise. Nuclear non-proliferation -prol deals mean nothing. You give up nukes in exchange for assurances that you won't be invaded. Because a nuke is just an assurance that you won't be invaded. Your point is that we should never... They should never have done that. No. I think we'd like, be looking at a very serious? different Holy world if, uh, for Ukrainians at least if with, we didn't. With the benefit of hindsight, I th I, how could you say that? I mean, I don't think they would get invaded right now if they had nukes, right? I mean... well. If you have nukes, it's you don't get invaded. Just, That's just kind of well, how it works. Anyway, we made a guarantee to them that you know, you give up your nukes and we will got your back. And so I do that's feel like that's a pretty important mean. agreement to uphold. Mm. I mean... What? what? You're talking <laughs> about American promises to Ukraine in exchange <laughs> for... Uh, they're surrendering their nukes. Surrendering their nukes. Yeah, um, America, f America never like actually followed through on any of their promises. America's still not following technically their promises of defending Ukraine. They're just giving Ukrainians weapons. Ukraine is currently sitting. That was the okay. What was the promise? Did did America did the Budapest Memorandum was the, was the American promise that we're going to put fucking Yankee Yankee boots in the ground? I don't think that was the promise. Oh my god, this fucking loser in chat. Can someone? Jesus Christ, hang on. No, the Budapest Memorandum, it's, it's deliberately vague because circumstances are going to be different. It was that the United States would respect Ukrainian sovereignty. And the interpretation of that is that since they don't have uh, nuclear weapons, then they need some kind of assurance against invasion, which means that America will help them. I don't know where he gets, gets this idea from that like America is falling short of what, sending troops to Ukraine? And actually, like, fucking scrapping with Russians? I don't even think um, Zelensky wants, wants that. He's never asked for that. There's like a whole fact check thing here, because apparently, um, yeah, Zelensky didn't say US troops are needed to fight in Ukraine. This is recent, 2023, yeah. There's like a, f a fucking badly translated clip saying that uh, Americans will have to send their sons and daughters to Ukraine. No, that yeah, there's no America. That's the it's the fucking both sides thing. I don't know if you can just accept that some countries are worse than others, that some policies are worse than others, that some leaders are worse than others. Then you don't need to both sides it. Russia, we've got a very long list of agreements that they violated. I don't know exactly what the United States has violated with respect to Ukraine. Seems to me that they're doing what they said they would do, which was help Ukraine if they get invaded. It doesn't mean they were, there was, there, there's no, fuck off, what, okay. Unless someone can show me. I don't think there's any, ever been any United States promise saying that if Ukraine gets invaded, then we'll put in, we'll put in this, we'll, we'll send in the SEALs, we'll send in Arnold Schwarzenegger and uh, fucking Jack Bauer or whoever else, Mark Wahlberg. In a very unique position that I see uh, happen in the same cycle of violence in the Middle East all the fucking time. Cycle America goes violence, to cool. a militant group and says, hey, we're going to give you weapons you want autonomy, <coughs> specifically Kurds, right? You think Which every country have a, should have a nuclear bomb? I think every, every country citizen should in have this one. current 
<laughs> Every <laughs> citizen of America. Yeah, that's Tim Pool's. I think that's in the Tim current Pool's formation, position. if you have a nation state, you have to have a fucking nuke. Otherwise, America will Jesus. come and fuck you up. So you uh, think every nation should. Otherwise, America will come. Bro, how can you? Okay, whatever. Should have a nuke. Clear. I think oh, either yeah. every nation has a nuke or none of them have it. And I would Jesus. obviously want none of the nations to have it. But less is which is better. why I was in support of the Iranian denuclearization agreement. I thought that was good. Well, yeah, which... that's why we have non proliferation. Oh, God, these guys are so dumb. Like, this is. This isn't even just misinformation or ideological bias. Or This is just actually being fucking retarded. Like, um,. It's just not understanding just like the very basic logical conclusions of like if more countries have nukes, there's more chances for things to go wrong. It's simple. That's why we support non-proliferation. Which, you know, Donald Trump fucked up. Oops. I believe an individual citizen in this country has a right to own. You believe a every person war. should have a nuclear bomb. That's <laughs> yes. the socialist vision. Of, yes, uh, I think everyone America. should have a nuclear bomb. I mean, that's the only <laughs> equality that, that we can really everyone should have a nuclear silo in their garage. So, okay, in short, you support Ukraine. What, what the allied powers are doing to support them is, is right. Mm. No, because <laughs> America's interest in oh, Ukraine no. is not one that is genuine. Uh, America's interest in Ukraine is just That's fucking... a different question. It's not whether or not it's coming from a good place. It's whether it's the right decision. You can make the right decision for the wrong reasons. I care about the interest. I don't no, but that's care about American interest. Because, I'm asking ooh, what you think. Because, no, America's interest in Ukraine is incredibly nothing, important. What do you think is the right thing to do in Ukraine? I told you what I think but the right then, thing to then do is. Then I asked Minsk you and you said no. Up the deal, instead of fucking up the deal that Ukraine had with Russia, by, uh, you know, <laughs> Boris Johnson fucking showing up in the middle of that, going to Kiev directly. Dude, do you think what's happening? Ah, no, Boris, jo Boris Johnson, the puppet master of Ukraine. God. There's, you know, there's a reason Ukrainians actually kind of like Boris Johnson. I don't think they would like him very much if he fucked a peace deal. That's... He can't do that. He's Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson... Oh, God. <laughs> Again, yeah, like, by the time the 15-point thing was even announced, there was so much indication that Russia was not negotiating in good faith. With the uh, bioweapons warning, with the demands of Putin that were tantamount to a surrender, with Lavrov saying that anything Ukraine asked for was completely unreasonable, with Putin constantly saying that he was going to achieve all of his goals of the special military operation, with the fucking, eventually, the massacres in Butsha where they found out that Russia had committed some of the worst war crimes in fucking uh, history since Yugoslavia. Despite Ukraine making every effort to or organize humanitarian corridors that Russia kept on uh, kicking the can down the road or rejecting, I mean, fuck. Oh, God. I can see why my video got posted in the H3 subreddit now. You see, there's a difference between if you have, like, misinformation or like you've just you're you've got like an ideological bias that maybe leads you to ignore certain facts or to mischaracterize certain facts like it's i feel like a lot of people do that but like people have biases right but if your bias is to, to the point that you think that you think there was a peace deal that had promise on both sides but boris johnson went to ukraine and gave a speech that is probably the most boring fucking speech I've ever seen in my life. And basically just says, like, yeah, we don't like it. And then Ukraine's like, oh, okay. Oh, shit. <laughs> was kind of looking forward to peace there, Mr. Johnson. But, uh, you know, going to do as we're told. Fuck. There's right. If not, why? Do I think what's and happening? The allied you power. ask me a question, I answer it, and then you move on to something no, different. No, because you, I, I asked you. I'm telling you what I want. The allied powers is what they're doing. They're right. You said no, but I just got done having this whole conversation where you said yeah. I think what the allied powers are doing, as far as like, uh, as far as giving weapons to Ukraine with no end in sight, because they see it as a great way to fucking like a uh, great way to continue the the harm done to a weak Russia that they can simultaneously claim is like really fucking powerful. Is is only going to continue this war rather than try to fucking implement security commitments and and get to a a 
uh, uh, a unilateral <laughs> agreement or a bilateral agreement where, uh, and not just uh, fucking Russia and Ukraine, but like bring China. Uh, uh, unilateral agreement. Uh, okay. He's just saying words now. A <laughs> unilateral agreement. What the fuck does that look like? Like a surrender? Uh, okay. An unconditional surrender. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, he keeps saying America should give Ukraine security guarantees. Or, um, Well, I, I, the Budapest memorandum kind of was. It just didn't work, obviously, because Russia broke it. But what would the other security guarantee be? Because it seems to be now that... Um, that being aligned, he changed to bilateral. I know it was just funny that he said unilateral first. Okay, it was funny. <laughs> I'm not going to go too hard on that one, but um, damn, chat's fighting over it. So, yeah, is the security guarantee going to be NATO? It can't be NATO because you need to push Russia out of the entire country before Ukraine can join NATO. Um, oh. China to the table and put an end, like do a ceasefire and put an end to this war is infinitely better for Ukraine in Ukrainian development, Ukrainian economy, Ukrainian citizens not fucking dying uh, senselessly under a, a uh, artillery shelling campaign that's literally happening. You know what's really fucking insane about this? Russia is getting artillery shells from North Korea and America is giving, uh, America's telling South Korea to give artillery shells to Ukraine. It's fucking nuts. Both sides are just fucking need, shelling each other. They need shells. But it's so stupid. Who's gonna Ukraine make is the now shells? also using uh, uh, depleted uranium uh, as well on its own fucking soil. Okay, that so is your, going to have your damaging position implications. is that the that's gonna allies have damaging... helping Ukraine is good, but that Ukraine needs to be more willing to make concessions to Not Russia. just Ukraine. Our, no, allies need to be more willing to, uh, to, to some, in certain instances, even push Ukraine to make uh understandable uh concessions with because like the giving idea up land what like giving up land not giving that, up like land the, no it's not oh. giving up land but what, what concession then hassan in the very beginning of the invasion zelensky already said that he was willing to leave nato off the table he would give a guarantee that ukraine would not join nato that seemed to be i i feel like a year and a half ago that was the big reason everyone gave that was the same reason that that fucking mearsheimer dipshit gave has everyone just walked away from that now has everyone just walked away from the? Uh, has everyone just walked away from the fact that it, like this was all to do with NATO? Because now that Zelensky offered to not join NATO and offered to give a guarantee against joining NATO, N NATO, sorry, um, and that didn't change anything. If they're not going to give up land, do you think Russia's going to stop invading if Ukraine wants all the land back? Because part of that land is Crimea. It. What are the consequences of depleted uranium, you guys are asking in chat? I actually don't know. Do they pose a health risk? Depleted uranium missions are not considered nuclear weapons. Their emission of low levels of radiation has led the nuclear watchdog to urge caution when handling and warn of the possible dangers of exposure. Handling of such ammunition should be kept to a minimum and protective apparel gloves should be worn. Public information campaign. Risk assessment. So they're advising on how to use it because because um, it's not a violation of international law. I know that. You are allowed to use it. It's just the... Uh, it's mainly a toxic chemical as opposed to a radiation hazard. Aerosols, kidney damage. Ooh. They were used by US tanks in the Gulf War. Oh no. And in Iraq, Serbia, and Kosovo. In some instances, levels of contamination could rise after some years. Okay. The Russian embassy called it inhuman. Oh, I fucking hate these people, man. They're so horrible. The Russian embassy and the Russian ambassador are just... How do they do it? It's so strange. After making Ukraine the most mined country in the world, it's going to take like a hundred years just to get rid of all the fucking Russian landmines in the country. Like, oh God. 
Oh, oh, apparently uh, timeouts don't work on this absolute fucking retard who can't even spell the word nuke. Go away. Fuck off. Go find a bridge. Pushing a referendum 15 years into the future for Crimea is a, a really solid uh, middle-of-the-ground approach the that Zelensky's own team actually put forward, which I thought was great. Do you think Zelensky's a provocateur? No. The 15-year thing with Crimea, I'd imagine if you're Ukrainian, you're going to be very, very cautious of that point because if it's a 15-year wait and you already know that the last time Russia had a hold of Crimea without any interruptions, they used it to conscript people and militarize the region and use it as a launch pad for an invasion they get another 15 years to do that and even more people who are pro-ukraine leave the con leave the peninsula and even more um tatars fucking get washed up in rivers or thrown into detention centers or uh prisoner or fucking political prisoner uh fuck me political prison facilities like um i don't know i feel like that would even getting the 15 year thing would be very contentious for crimea but again, my guess is Ukraine and the Ukrainian people are not really going to be up for conceding anything until they get the uh, 2022 borders back. That seems to be the most frequent opinion. What? Oh, should I have a doctor's appointment? What the fuck? Wait, wh oh, I'm just asking because I've that's a position. I'm not. I'm not saying that you ever said that. <laughs> what? You said it like I've said it. <laughs> no, no. I was just getting your opinion on it. Just because I've heard people say that, and I was just doing it. I was just checking your opinion on it. No, what I think... What time is it at, Lena? It's at... It's at two. That's my last part, though, basically. No, I don't think Zelensky is a... I know, I just spell it. I'm just using NV, NV. Oh, well. It's a good thing we have humans to moderate this channel. Sorry, in case anyone didn't know, um, don't uh, threaten to don't like advocate for the nuking of any country on this channel. It's not actually not something that we do. It's um, you know, we discuss the nuances of second strike capabilities and all that. But my God, we don't actually no. We tend to not say to nuke places. It tends to be bad. And when I say tends to be, it basically always is always yeah provocateur what like a bad it's just not my actor. vibe no i think Zelensky is uh, uh certainly a, a self-interested politician who uh definitely well, wants emancipation self literally yeah meaning his well, anyway yeah no I, he wants he wants russia to no longer have uh control over ukrainian territories which is oh my perfectly i'm reasonable. not even as a fucking joke you absolute dipshit what why why are you doing this stop he also has to strike a delicate balance because, as I correctly pointed out, when the invasion first happened, whenever oh uh, an God. irredentist or imperialist power makes a move on another nation, you embolden some of the most reactionary forces and they are seen as liberators because in that moment, they are the liberators, the ones who have the violent means to... to okay, John T. Carrot, you're the last one, okay? I'm timing you out. I'm timing Warthongs out. Any next person who says to nuke fucking anything or anywhere gets banned, okay? I don't care. I don't care how long you've been in this channel. It's, it's, just, it's just annoying. Fuck. <laughs> Lonerbox, you should talk to Destiny. I think you and him would agree on a lot of things. Oh, okay. Um, I feel like a few people have said that. <laughs> I want. I can't imagine which streamer isn't streaming today when they usually would be. Wow. Push back are going to be seen as protectors. That only grows nationalistic, hyper-nationalistic sentiment, and that is never productive, that is never good, that's not good for workers' rights, that's not good for uh, future prospects of Ukraine, and I think that that blowback, uh, who knows what's going to happen, but is is terrifying. I have to leave, bro. All right. But it's one thing, I thank you for going so long. How long have we been going? No, Wait, what you the know fuck who happened needs there? to leave? Three hours. Vladimir Putin. I agree. Needs to leave. That's needs to leave brave. those people alone. Hey!
Putin. I'm gonna leave say those safe. people and alone. And I know that's controversial, but he's gotta leave. This is probably our most, our longest episode, and we did it. That not even mentioning that, that Dan guy just he just gives me all the wrong vibes. Didn't he try to say that Europe had a bunch of socialist governments, like communist governments? And then and then pivoted away from it like a fucking ballerina. Like, yeah. In a single uh, current event. Uh, we did mention that Rupert Murdoch died. Um, that turned out to be misinformation that we were dead. spreading. But no, I said, is he dead? He oh, okay. Dead He's not dead. Not yet. Yet. Not yet. Okay. He's getting up there. Well, Ninety something. I think this was a good conversation. Yeah, was, good. was that good? Did you? Do you feel like uh, I'm a I'm a fucking anti-America charlatan no. with who's bad faith? No, who just not, doesn't... no. I I think your foreign policies after talking them out is they're all like completely defensible um, and 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 good positions on the point of socialism. I can say like, well, I, I have a deeper. What do we think, chat? Do we still think uh, Hassan is a what? What do you say? Anti-American, bad faith, charlatan. Would he even deny being anti-American? Uh, I don't know. What do we think, chat? This poor victim of bad faith criticism from people who uh, disagree with him. Has this changed your mind on Hassan? Does it? Does it? Do you see him uh, fucking f dancing so carefully around both sides so he doesn't like alienate himself from the social democrats in uh, Ethan's audience or from the liberals in Ethan's audience? Whoa. Maybe we should get some ones in chat, eh? If we think Hassan is actually a bad faith dumb fuck, whatever. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> what do we think? I can't see any. He's off the hook. No one's in chat. Oh no. Oh no. Here they come. Oh no. Second strike. Understanding of it now. I, I, I do still believe that it seems more mystical and no, uh, you want Mark. I do think it is actually like unambiguously bad faith. If you're going on to other channels saying or no, on Ethan's channel, didn't he say that he didn't want to talk about China and Taiwan? He was like, he was skirting around the issue because he didn't want to see subreddit posts talking about how pro-China he is. I feel like that's an admission of bad faith, isn't it? If you're not going to state your position with your chest, like a man, if you're not going to do that, then you are, you kind of are bad faith, actually, yeah. Because, because of the audience you're talking to, you're going to change your position, you're going to, like, couch your positions. You're not going to be frank about what you believe? Because you're trying to radicalize Ethan's fucking liberal audience? <laughs> you want Marx's, Leninist, Kleinist oh. thought, uh, but, but, which is socialism with capitalist characteristics. Yes, and ultimately, that is what I want. And ultimately, <sighs> we agree almost entirely. And if you're mad about that, you're dumb. I'm mad. Yeah. You're All a right. dumb idiot. I have to pee Freaking really bad. Got him, now. You're watching this and you're angry. You're a stupid. Freaking bastard. got him, man. Dumbass. Whoa. No, I thought that was good. I thought that was good. I think so too. Unless you're Ukrainian, then you have a then. I mean, they have a right at least. Yeah, They're no, there. for sure. I understand. Or Taiwanese. That. Or Tibetan. <laughs> I understand. They have a right to be angry. I'm just. <laughs> I, 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 I get it. You're an armchair Stop warrior. My who, tongue. Like, we're gonna. Me. We're gonna get. We're gonna not get. Not if you're Russian or Chinese. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> That's funny. Al and graduated. From I, can't, I don't think he even realized. There's he doesn't realize he's doing it, does he? You're okay with that conversation, unless you're the countries that are getting fucked with by bigger countries. <laughs> for, I can't wait for uh, so, yeah. So many, so many people from Virginia, <laughs> Langley, uh, writing about how they've been living in Taiwan for 25 years. Right, like those. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I thought that was a good faith conversation. I thought it was fantastic. I thought it was good to um. And it was good for me to kind of explore it's what the, I think. It, it's the classic, like, uh, uh, Donald Trump, my people yearn for freedom, please glass Iran uh, take that you hear from, uh, you know, people living on American soil. Thank like, you. The only oh, yeah, this is like when every country like Taiwan or whatever, uh, uh, this the people, fucking tankies in my Discord used to do this meme. When people in Taiwan or wherever else are like saying that... Uh, 
when you have polling data that say like Taiwan, they 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 kind of like they 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 like de facto independence. They probably would rather have uh, de jure independence, but they won't want they won't go for it because it'll antagonize China and they'll get fucking invaded or whatever. But it's like you would post these polls about Taiwanese opinions on independence or even on America, and then the response would be, oh. America, my country yearns for freedom because there was some Twitter thing that was fake once, and it's like, oh, oh, I guess it's all like that then, right? Yeah, like, oh god, they're so dumb. Anyway, hang on, wait, what was it? What is international opinion on America? Because I think I've seen this one, but it only gives you countries that I would actually expect to be have favorable opinions of America. Like Canada, Poland, obviously Poland, um, Israel, obviously South Korea, obviously Japan, Australia, Singapore, Malaysia, not so much. I don't know why that is. Greece is pretty split. Where's Serbia? I want to see Serbia. <laughs> Someone in chat thinks I'm a tanky. Oh no. Um, Vietnam. Oh, yeah, like you'd show them a poll saying that Vietnam supports um, not only uh, America, but also like Doi Moi and fucking uh, free markets and all that shit. And then it's like, oh, <laughs> Vietnamese person, my country yearns for freedom. Like they just don't believe it. They think it's fake. Yeah. Um, opinion on USA. And I think Vietnamese people have a favorable view of Americans because of South China Sea, you know, so they can do their business there. <laughs> uh oh. Wait, is this um, Vietnamese adults have favorable views of? Oh, okay, so not of China. Okay. Huh. Uh oh. To save Iran is by glassing it. Thank you. All right. I have to pee so bad. That's what Ian said. Oh. Thanks, bro. See you next week. Bye. This everybody. riff just sounds like the most American dipshit rendition of uh, Black Dog, doesn't it? Da -da 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 -da. Yeah. Oh. I got a beat too. Not that bad. Okay. American burger riff. Yeah. Oh, well. That was a good show. I enjoyed the content, you know? It gave us a lot to talk about. Gave me a lot to think about, actually. I mean, it didn't really at all, but... Um, no, it was good. I hope they do more of it. I actually hope they do more of it, because... I don't know. Something about Hassan trying to navigate those conversations with someone who... Let's face it. No disrespect to Ethan, like he would say this himself. Is like, if you want to out debate him, like or convince him, as I feel like he's probably an easy target. No, but apparently not. Apparently, he uh, seems to give Hassan some trouble, which is really funny. Someone said that there was um that there's a stream of Hassan with uh, Boy Boy, where he is a lot more mask off with his opinions on. Uh, Taiwan and China. Is that true? Because I haven't seen that one. I've I've heard about it, but I haven't seen it. I think it was it was on South China Sea. The stream was about or where is it? I uh, does anyone know? Does anyone have the link? Do not want to put it in my stream chat? I don't think they spoke about Taiwan and the deprogram. No, it was the boy boy guy. Because we covered um, boy boy's video on Ukraine and it was fucking terrible. We just went through all of it and it was horseshit. Yeah. It was just the same old uh, Mir Scheimer, Victoria Newland phone call. I feel like um, I feel like we need a thing. Yeah, socialists dismiss every cr criticism as iPhone, Vuvuzela, 100 million dead. Need a Ukraine equivalent for like Victoria Newland phone call, fall of the USSR was actually really bad. Like all this shit. Yeah. 
14 billion dead in the Donbass, all killed by Ukrainians. Yeah. But if anyone wants to go to my stream chat, a thread about Minsk. Interesting. Stop arming Ukraine. Reasonable person. What exactly do you suggest instead? Pressure Ukraine to implement the Minsk Accords. So what are the Minsk Accords? And why is the tanky line on Minsk ridiculous? A thread. Tanky propaganda on Minsk is an attempt to shift blame from Russia, where it properly belongs, to Ukraine, where it doesn't. If only Ukraine implemented Minsk, we wouldn't be in this situation. It's straight gaslighting. To simplify things, I'll call it gas Minsking. Okay, this guy is so corny. Oh my god. Anyway. PhD. I'm going to keep this as short as possible. Since explaining the intricacies of the Minsk process is only slightly more alluring than the thought of blowing my brains out. But it's important because tankies, when pressed for details on a peace deal, use Minsk as their trump card. Let's see if they have anything more that I haven't come up with. You won't hear most tankies talk about Minsk, but a few do. Take Caitlin Johnson, for instance, if he began honoring the Minsk agreements. I mean, this was also Roger Waters. This was obviously Hassan. This was, I think, boy, boy. Uh, this was that every fucking tanky we've spoken about will bring up Minsk. Yeah. Most of them, <clears throat> most of them, I'll ask them what Minsk was, but they don't, they just don't know. So, yeah. Gas Minsking boils down to a few claims, two of which we'll examine here. First, Minsk has always offered the best path to peace, and still does. Second, Minsk's failure to bring peace was the result of Ukraine's refusal to abide by the terms. So my guess is they did refuse to abide to the terms, but that's because Russia denied that one of their ends of the terms even existed. They denied that they had mercenaries and Russian personnel in the country, even though one of the terms was to get foreign personnel out of the country. But yeah. Uh, what's going on here? Aaron Mate. I'm not justifying the invasion. <laughs> the question is whether Russia had issued reasonable proposals that could have avoided it. Given that Russia tried to enforce Minsk and submitted detailed proposals, that's just not true. That's just not true. They denied that their end of the deal even existed, you fucking moron. All right. Um, you don't have to endorse Russia's invasion to recognize how it could have been avoided. Oh yeah, the, the US pledged to halt NATO expansion, which didn't exist. Okay. It was referring to military installations in East Germany, one inch eastward. That's never, never been a deal to... There was never any deal ensuring that they wouldn't expand NATO into other countries. There's never been a deal about that. Even Gorbachev admits that. Ukraine upholding Minsk two agreements signed in 2020, 2015. Okay. In late February 2014, mere days after Yanukovych fled, Russian troops occupied Crimea. Soon after, the Kremlin launched a major initiative to stir up separatist anti-government protests in other parts of eastern and southern Ukraine. That spring, the Kremlin financed and organized demonstrations of paid protesters across eastern and southern Ukraine. The idea was to create the appearance of an organic local uprising. Leaked tapes from Putin and advisor Sergei Glazhev reveal the scope of these efforts. I knew this. I knew that they were doing this. Hey, cool. One of the key ideas Glazhev pushes during his conversations is that all uprisings must appear to be from the local population. I wonder why. This has been the plan in Crimea on 26 February that the Crimean Tatars and other Ukrainians who gathered in support of Ukraine's unity thwarted. They denied it in Crimea as well, didn't they? Didn't they say that Crimea had um, authentically declared independence before Russian troops went into the region? Again, that was false too, yeah. Key policy decisions, uh, appetite, so-called Novorussia. Integration of Ukraine's eastern oblasts within the Russian Federation. Interesting. Okay. Source for the leaks, including transcripts. That Russia had to wholly manufacture this uprising shows just how anemic separatist sentiment was among residents of eastern and southern Ukraine. A fact confirmed by opinion polls at the time. Oh my god, I remember people, I, I showed this poll to, I think, Fabian Liberty, and he just said it was fake. <laughs> like, or he didn't, yeah, no, this is true, yeah. Like, there's never been any indication that um, Donetsk or Lugansk wanted to, those who wanted, you want Ukraine to join Russia. 
Even Crimea, I see this as well, like before the annexation, the, the polls on Crimea, people keep saying that it was like 60% of them wanted to join Russia before the annexation. The polls did not indicate that. Polls were fluctuating on Crimea. I don't think there's actually ever been any confirmation. There's, there's definitely no consensus that the majority of Crimeans actually wanted to join Russia before the annexation. Polling afterwards shows a lot of approval for the annexation, but the problem is polling agencies struggle in a territory that is annexed and where people who speak out against what's happening are getting thrown into fucking uh, jails or uh, having their bodies washed up in rivers. Most of the people, a lot of people who opposed the annexation fled and the people who stayed, who oppose it, are keeping their heads down. If you want to do reliable polling, you have to like go and talk to the people as well. Like, yeah. This was, a, this was a common complaint from, I think, 538. They were complaining about how difficult it was to poll people in Crimea. Yeah, they supported economic integration. I don't think they supported, yeah, uniting into a single state. Yeah. Not that this is surprising. Crimea is Ukraine's only majority, uh, only majority ethnic Russian province. But note how much lower support for joining Russia was than the percent of ethnic Russians in each region. Even ethnic Russians weren't all enthusiastic about joining Russia. True. Sevastopol, 71%. Zaporizhia, 24%. Really not that much. And same poll again. This was true with the uh, Eurasian customs as well. Russian majority areas of Ukraine didn't want to join the Eurasian customs. That's why the parliament was able to get 300 plus votes in favor of the EU deal. The Tatars boycotted the election. Yeah. Yeah, of course they did, yeah. So it's no wonder that the Kremlin had to forge a fake rebellion out of whole cloth. Still, local residents weren't buying it, and it never got off the ground. So Putin responded by sending irregular Russian forces into the Donbass to pose as native rebels. This is the thing. One of the terms of Minsk was for these people to leave. And Putin denied that they were there at the time. There's a mountain of evidence confirming the presence of irregular Russian forces in the Donbass operating under the Kremlin's direction. Report. Have I? I haven't read this. Have I? I feel like I've read a shortened version of this. This is really familiar to me for some reason. Okay. Um, but I think this will tell you, yeah, I'd imagine this will tell you all about how the separatists uh, who came from Russia went into government buildings and occupied them and also took over the TV broadcasting and they replaced a lot of the TV broadcasts with uh, Russian media. So yeah, yeah. The Russian irregulars seized considerable territory and set up Russian proxy administrations in Donetsk and Luhansk. Hey, I knew that. Okay. Only then did Kiev, bankrupt and with no military worthy of the name, thanks to Yanukovych's outrageous plundering, launch its first military operation. Incredibly, uh, Kiev's improvised forces, cobbled together from state and private actors and financed in part from small donations, started absolutely kicking ass, recovering most of the lost territory and confining the Russian irregulars to a small size of land. Faced once again with humiliating defeat, Putin brought out the big guns. In August 2014, he sent thousands of regular Russian troops into the Donbass. The arrival of actual Russian army units turned the tide, reconquering most of the land Ukrainian forces had recently recovered. Russian defense expert Igor Sutygin estimated that several thousand Russian regulars were present in the Donbass at this time, a number that would peak at 10,000 by mid-December 2014. Okay. I actually didn't know the number of Russian personnel who were there. Likewise, as of September 2014, the Russian Committee of Soldiers Mothers, an independent NGO in Russia, estimated that 10 to 15,000 regular Russian troops had already been sent into Ukraine. Isn't it crazy that for LNR and DNR, like, so one of the most common talking points was that when Yanukovych was overthrown, people in eastern Ukraine rose up because they were angry about the Azov Battalion, the right sector, and language laws. Isn't that crazy that that was a narrative we heard so much? That was what Gravel said. Gravel Institute said that. And just to see how unbelievably wrong they were about why those uprisings started. 
Because if it were the case that a sizable number of people in Donetsk and Luhansk genuinely wanted to join Russia, and they were afraid of persecution by like right wing Ukrainians, and if they uh, were having their language suppressed, like that actually makes the uprising seem kind of justified. Like, but it wasn't that at all. It was a country that was butt mad about losing its fucking uh, puppet leader and then trying to grab whatever they could and foment whatever unrest they could as a, as a cope. The OSCE, whose representatives had been observing events on the ground since 2014, until Russia knocked them out in 2021, had documented the presence in the Donbass of thousands of Russian soldiers. In 2016, the International Criminal Court found evidence of direct military engagement between the respective armed forces of the Russian Federation and Ukraine, from July 14, 2015 at the latest. Of course, there is also the testimony of the Russian nationals dispatched by the Kremlin to take command of the irregular forces. They freely acknowledge the war effort would have failed were it not for the arrival of the Russian army units. The Russian military's success against Ukraine's dilapidated forces compelled Kyiv to sue for peace. The result was the Minsk Accords. They consisted of two agreements, first signed in September 2014 and the second, dubbed Minsk, Minsk II, following in February 2015. To crudely summarize, Minsk's key provisions called for an immediate ceasefire, the withdrawal of forces, the decentralization of power to Donetsk and Luhansk, and the holding of local elections in the two regions. Crucially, the elections were to be carried out under Ukrainian law, with Ukraine's involvement and under the supervision of the OSCE. But Russia's Donbass proxies just went ahead and held sham elections on their own, outside the Minsk framework and with no monitoring. I did, I did not know that. I did not know they did that. What the fuck? Wow. I mean, the Kremlin was well aware that most of the local population was not behind its occupation, so conducting free and fair elections under international monitoring wasn't exactly an option, was it? I did know that. How do you know I, how do you know I knew that, Pedro? What? Is that what this article says? OSCE? Sham elections? So-called elections not in line with Minsk protocol. Oh my god. That's, that's insane chat. That's absolutely crazy. That's crazy chat. It's absolutely <laughs> insane that this happened, that Russia would do this. Give me money. Here again are opinion polls by region on supporting support for joining Russia. Local enthusiasm at the prospect of becoming the 47th and 48th oblasts of Russia wasn't exactly overwhelming. They're still polling in 2014 when the fighting happens. Oh, you're are you just posting the same screenshots again, motherfucker? Fuck off. All right. Russian election rigging wasn't the only problem. Both sides repeatedly violated the ceasefire too. But only Russia's forces went so far as to conquer more territory, taking advantage of Ukraine's weak military position. What's worse, Russia wouldn't even admit it was party to the agreements. The prompt, this prompted a logical question. Why then the hell did you sign them? Russia's stance was, if you want Minsk to be implemented, talk to the Donbass rebels, whom we have nothing to do with. Oh. Didn't know that either. Diplomat reminds the US, Ukraine, that Russia is not party to Minsk agreements. I guess you, because they're denying their involvement. Yeah, you wouldn't negotiate with Putin because Putin doesn't, uh, at this point, is saying that he's not involved, that it's local Russians. That's really interesting. Holy shit. I didn't, I didn't even know that chat. It's crazy. It's insane. For Ukraine, this was a non-starter, as the Donbass rebels operated under Moscow's control and relied on the presence of Russian forces. As a result, Ukraine insisted that Russia take responsibility for fulfilling its end of the Minsk bargain. Okay. I feel like that point at the end is the more crucial one. I think what happens when I read this stuff is... Because I'm a dickhead. Um, I kind of filter out... Uh, I kind of filter the the debate winning talking points and the extra details like I forget a lot more quickly 
Like I, I don't. Those election points. That is a good point, though. Why did I forget that? I don't think I knew that. I don't think I knew that. Matsugen, holy shit! Thanks for the ten gifted tier one subs. I really appreciate that. I think they're tier one, but thank you so much. Hey, that's so kind of you. That's so based. Boost. Okay. Still going. As if all that weren't enough, the Minsk Accords turned out to be a jumbled mess of mutually contradictory provisions which were accordingly interpreted by the two sides in polar opposite terms. Mercifully, Duncan Allen of Chatham House explains it all so I don't have to. Oh my god. Stalemate. Contradictory. Articles 1 and 2. Lasting ceasefire and pullback of heavy weaponry. Before a dialogue in elections. Loner Despot getting the Murdoch money now. I know, right? I need the, uh, no, it's not even, uh, Tucker Carlson or, uh, it's like the, uh, it's like the guards of Agrabah who cut people's hands off for stealing. That's what I'm representing, you know, because I'm like Middle Eastern and shit. Article 4 is ambiguous where the dialogue begins the day after the pullback. Russia has yet to withdraw its troops, but yeah, they denied them. I don't know how important this is. This is like intense analysis. Oh, God. Minsk 2. Evacuate troops. Return the border to Ukraine. Okay. Elections OSCE. Decentralization. Mutually exclusive views of sovereignty. This is like the China thing. The China thing says that it wants to respect sovereignty of both sides, but both sides have different interpretations of uh, what's sovereign. Russians think uh, Donetsk, Luhansk, Kherson, and Zaporizhia is Russia's sovereign territory. Uh, yeah. Okay. Interesting. That's why that Chinese plan was fucking bullshit. All right. Consequently, Minsk was stillborn from the start and would largely remain so all the way up to Russia's second invasion, 2022. But it's silly to argue, as tankies like Kaito's, Kato's uh, and Aaron Mate do, that Ukraine is the only side standing in the way of Minsk implementation. Look at this breakdown of the Minsk provisions as of 2020 and note how many labeled not implemented depends exclusively on Russia. Yep. They never did this. They denied that they ever needed to do this. And they, I guess we're just learning they didn't do that. Restoring Ukraine's control over its border, removing all foreign armed troops from Ukraine, holding free and fair elections at the Donbass. Russia ain't about to let any of that happen, ever. <laughs> True. Okay. Giga Chad. Um. Many of the partially implemented provisions, too, remain that way, largely, if not entirely, because of Russia's intr intransigent... Oh, yeah. Let's be uh, disciplined. Intransigence. Oh, I'm sorry. Because of Russia's intransigence. Uh -huh. Another key to understanding Minsk's failure was that Ukraine signed the agreements under duress having just been beaten back by the arrival of Russian army units. Thanks largely to Yanukovych's looting, you'll recall, Ukraine no longer possessed a proper military of its own. I knew that. I said that Ukraine was pressured into the Minsk Accords. People in chat said that was not true. Fuck you. Fuck you. So, Minsk reflected Ukraine's weak position and Russia's comparable strength at the time of sighting. The terms, if implemented, would have been devastating to Ukraine's sovereignty, resulting in an effectively independent Donbass under Russia's de facto control. Lots of civil wars end with the successful adoption of a federal state structure that grants autonomy to a secessionist region. But this wasn't a civil war. It was a state-to-state -state war being treated as a civil war. Donbass autonomy would thus amount to Ukraine's partition. In addition, over the ensuing years, Ukraine built its military into the formidable fighting force the world has come to recognize this past year. So, as time wore on, Kiev had less incentive to abide by Minsk, having agreed to the terms when it was a far weaker position. 
Not that Ukraine has any moral obligation to comply. The only reason the Minsk Accords exist in the first place is because Russia, by invading Crimea and Donbass, broke its own past pledges to abide by Ukraine's territorial sovereignty. That's the Budapest Memorandum, we know that. We've already spoken about that, chat. It's crazy. Nor was the Budapest Memorandum include, uh, the only instance in which Russia promised to respect Ukraine's sovereignty, uh, including Crimea. Moscow made the same pledge in 97. I didn't know about that. I didn't know about the Russian-Ukrainian friendship treaty. Or I read it and forgot it. Who knows? Yeah, it could be anything. So, anyone who wants to come at me with some sanctimonious lecture about how Ukraine violating its sacred treaty obligations can get the fuck out of here with that shit. Whoa. Anyway, Russia's extensive history of its shirking uh, its treaty commitments from the Budapest Memorandum up through the Minsk Accords sheds light on another tanky talking point. This supposed sabotage by the UK of an interim peace agreement. Oh my god, okay, I've already done this. And we, we shat on Aaron Mate. Should we just read it all the way? Maybe he, uh, like, he's already got details that I don't have, so I guess we'll do more. In early April, Ukraine and Russia were reportedly close to an interim settlement. Then UK Boris PM Boris Johnson showed up in Kyiv and told Zelensky that the West wasn't ready for Kyiv to sign anything, after which negotiations stalled. When the news broke, Tanky world entered a full-blown meltdown. See, NATO is forcing an unwilling Ukraine to slaughter its own people for the sake of its evil proxy war on Russia. Hello, Aaron Mate. God, Aaron Mate is so, he's so bad. Oh my God. Fuck, anyway. But put yourself in Zelensky's shoes in April 20, 2022. The horrific butcher revelations just broke. Russia's in retreat, in retreat. Ukraine is winning and has a chance to press the advantage. Yet, Germany's over here withholding crucial, wep crucial weaponry and insisting on peace negotiations. If you're Zelensky, your top priority is to keep the Western world united behind you. And if that means demonstrating to Germany your willingness to negotiate in good faith, then so be it. At the same time, Zelensky knows from experience how worthless Russia's word is. And it's perfectly obvious that an embattled Russia merely regarded the interim peace deal as a chance to regroup before resuming its campaign to conquer and dismember his country. I guess we've already kind of done this yeah so either a deeply credulous Zelensky really did intend to sign this agreement thus aiding Russia at Ukraine's expense or two he desperately wanted out of it while not alienating Germany in the process and Boris Johnson's intervention saved his ass either or pick one I didn't consider the Germany thing that Zelensky was pretending to be uh, interested in peace accords to appease Germany uh, or to you know But either way, I don't know if he's going to show the quotes of all the Russian officials saying that Ukraine's terms were completely unreasonable. But, but Maria Popova, the Jean Monnet chair in Europe and the rule of law at McGill, expert on Russian and Ukrainian politics, spells it out better than I ever could. Uh, okay. Zelensky situation at the time. He was begging for weapons, no fly zone. Signals from the West were mixed. Some were fear of escalation uh, in this context. This isn't really the full thread, is it? Appease Germany. Listen, there's always some. Germany always wants a bit of appeasement, you know? They just they love it. So there you have it. When tankies talk about Minsk, they're gaslighting people into believing Ukraine is at least as guilty as Russia for the current war. And the arguments they invoke to do so are about as silly as their other propagandistic musings. Slash end. Well done. I like this guy. He's, he's interesting. He's funny. Okay.